Dunkin' Donuts for me. Dunkin' Donuts for me. Dunkin' Donuts for me. I am a Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> Mary is the most amazing human being on the planet. Yeah. I am forever in really good Mary. Okay, okay hey everybody. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. I'm going to share with you uh, our Bobcat Rehab program that we have here at Big Car Rescue. Who are you? I'm Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> See my name tag? <laughs> At least she has her own identity. I'm like Howard, yeah. it's Carol's husband. Um, so uh, we get a lot of calls um, every year about people that find bobcat or see bobcats in their backyard, and they ask us to come relocate them. Um, we don't do that. It's not a good idea because taking a bobcat out of its um, its territory and putting it somewhere else is just upheaving its whole life. And um, it's actually, you, when you rescue a bobcat from the wild, um, you have to release it within the same county that it came from, close to the actual site it came from. So if you were to just take a bobcat out of somebody's backyard and put it you know, a few miles down the road, it's just gonna go back to its own territory, but it might get hit by a car trying to do so. Um, so we have uh, these brochures that we'll send to people, as well as some uh, digital downloads that for them uh, just to figure out ways that they can live with their wild neighbors. So we recommend that they keep small uh, pets and farm animals indoors at night or at least in a, a cage with a roof on it at night. And we also advise them not to have things that attract predators like bird feeders and squirrel feeders. So if your yard's full of things feeding little animals, bigger animals are going to naturally be attracted to that area. Um, and a lot of people have a fear that bobcats are carrying rabies and they're going to spread rabies and they don't actually carry rabies. Um, once they contract rabies, they die afterwards. So that they're not a carrier of rabies like raccoons or foxes are. Um, bobcats are found all throughout Florida and their uh, territory range can be as big as uh, six square miles and as small as one square mile. It just all depends on how much prey density is in the area. And the bobcat is the most heavily harvested cat um, for the past 20 years, with an average of 30 to 50,000 pelts being exported from the U.S. each year. In the 80s, they did a population estimate of bobcats being around 1 million, but there hasn't been any subsequent research of what their population numbers are currently. So wild bobcats come to Big Cat Rescue uh, for two reasons. The first and most common is uh, due to injury, usually after having been struck by a car. The most common injuries that we find in those cases are uh, breaks of the rear legs or the pelvis, um, which happens as they're crossing the road. They'll get clipped right as they're just about to make it across the road. We've also seen um, head impacts, uh, which isn't as common, but we've seen them, uh, that uh, can result in brain damage or vision damage to the bobcat. Injuries uh, also include disease. We've had bobcats come that were severely infested with parasites. Um, this one here had a case of mange. And when they get a really bad infestation like that, it weakens their immune system to the point that they can no longer take care of themselves and they become victims to other animals like coyotes or foxes. And we've even seen birth defects here where bobcats are isolated to small population or a small area of territory and they can't get anywhere because there's so much development around them. So they start interbreeding and they'll, that'll result in birth defects. We've had uh, kind of commonly actually in recent, in the recent past year, um, prescribed burns. So these can affect animals because they displace them from their territories, uh, but they're also a natural, or I'm sorry, a necessary means to control larger burns that can uh, result in mass destruction of areas. So they have prescribed burns where they'll take a section of forest and um, 
burn it, but they control how far the fire goes. And that helps get rid of all the leaves and the underbrush and everything that really fuels fires so that if there's a lightning strike and a fire were to occur, it doesn't travel very far. So the rehab process for injured bobcats is to provide them with the treatment that they need, give them time to recover here in our rehab enclosures or in the cat hospital, and then release them back into the wild. The other reason bobcats find their way to us is they're orphaned. And this can happen if the mother gets hit by a car um, or was trying to move her litter and gets separated for some reason. So our process with the orphans is to wean them as quickly as possible because we don't want them to imprint on us. We want to have as little contact with them as possible. In some cases, we'll provide a surrogate mother, a domestic cat mother that's nursing, to take care of the kittens. And um, once the kittens are at an age where they can be on their own, they'll go out to our rehab enclosures where we train them uh, to hunt. And then once they're old enough to take care of themselves and they're a little bit bigger, uh, about seven months is kind of the youngest that we release bobcats, um, we'll release them back into the wild. So the uh, veterinary care that we give the bobcats is the same as all the permanent residents out here. Um, when they first come in, we'll do a physical exam, we'll do x-rays to see if there's any injuries that aren't obvious, um, or to see the uh, extent of the injuries that we can see, like broken limbs. We'll do blood work to see uh, what their overall health is and if they have any kind of infectious diseases, and we'll do a fecal test. And nearly every single bobcat that's come here from the wild has tested positive for hookworms, which is a nasty parasite, uh, makes them kind of thin overall, but once it gets into the ground, um, it takes either burning the ground or sanitizing it completely with bleach or salting the earth to get rid of that parasite. So a lot of times when bobcats first come to us and they test positive for that, we have to keep them in the cat hospital where we can keep them completely uh, sanitized uh, before they go out into the rehab enclosures. They also get vaccinated for rabies and uh, common cat diseases while they're here, and they are, also, they are flea treated, and they get the same dewormers that everybody else out here gets. So the ivermectin and the panicure that we do for the permanent residents, they get as well. So our keepers for the Bobcat Rehab Program are level five interns or master keepers. Um, each in, uh, keeper has one day per week that's their dedicated rehab day where they take care of all the rehab bobcats currently uh, here. And um, I'll typically take two days a week, but if we have enough keepers, I'll keep it to one day. But I also go in and check on the cats several times a week just to make sure that they're progressing the way they need to. Uh, whenever we're around the bobcats, we wear ghillie suits like you see there on the left of the screen um, and we don't talk around the animals at all. The only time we talk around them is when they're getting examined in the cat hospital because that's like a scary experience already so talking around them it, it's not going to imprint them to like that experience um, but when we're out when they're in the hospital for long-term care or when they're out in the rehab enclosures we don't talk around them. So every day that uh, a keeper takes care of the rehab bobcats, we have to document everything that was done with the cat. So we have the date, the time of day that we took care of them, if we fed them, we log what we fed them, um, we log that we cleaned the enclosure, gave them uh, clean water, and then we make notes uh, on the chart as well for the next keeper to see if there's something there so that if we have questions we can go to that person and ask. And this is actually required for any rehab animal. You have to have daily logs just like this. So these are the four rehab enclosures we have currently. They're... I love that shot. <laughs> <laughs> Some drone footage. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we, uh, the party house is just over here. So the rehab enclosures are across the lake from the party house. And they're in an isolated area of the sanctuary where not many people go. The road there's trafficked very little. 
We're actually um, getting some quotes on doing a fencing along the between the road and the first rehab cage so that cars or people that are walking past there uh, won't be seen by the bobcats. So that's gonna be in the near future. Uh, so this is like the farthest part of our property that we can put the cats where they're away from all the busyness of the normal activities of taking care of the permanent residents and the tours. So these are kind of just a diagram of the rehab enclosures that we have. They have uh, three phases to them. So all the way on the left, we have our kitten cage and that's 10 foot by 20 foot and it's divided into two sections so we can shift them for cleaning. Um, then the next section is our medium section where kittens will go once they're at a certain weight or a certain age to give them a little bit more space to roam around and that's 40 feet by 20 feet. And the final uh, part of the cage that they get access to is 180 feet long and 20 feet wide. So it's a lot of space for them to exercise in. And I think the square footage of the cages is like over 4,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. or just under that 3,600 square feet um, so we try to keep them pretty natural and that's really easy with all the rain that we have mm -hmm. where we can't even keep up with the mowing out there there was nothing out there when we first built the cages we had to grow grass but now I mean I know a lot of the interns have been out there and seen how much grass there is now mm -hmm. <laughs> The fencing is made of one inch galvanized steel and that's, uh, we had to go with the smaller uh, squares on the chain link fencing so that the live prey can not escape the enclosure. <laughs> we use, we, the den boxes that they have also double as the transports that we use to take them to the release sites. So they're just wooden crates with a guillotine door on it and we'll put brush around them uh, so that the bobcats will want to go in there and once they use that as their normal den site it's pretty easy to get them to go into the crate on release day um, because that's their safe spot that they feel like they can get away from you but they don't know that they're going to get trapped in there. <laughs> so here's a little close-up view of the den boxes and we've made a lot of modifications to this over the over the years. At first it started out with just the box with the guillotine door on the front and we thought if we opened it the bobcats would just run away but that didn't always happen so then we put this back door on the cage so that we could open it and then hopefully that would spook the cat to run out of the box and it worked sometimes but not others and now we actually have a panel inside there that we can open the back of the transport crate and we can push the whole panel forward to the uh, the door of the crate so we can actually squeeze the cat out of the box <laughs> and it worked great with Noelle she was out of the box in 30 seconds <laughs> um, so the because the enclosures are roofed we can't incorporate trees for climbing so we provide them with alternatives we have these shelves that we'll put on the side of the enclosure. These are some of uh, the older <coughs> enclosures here. Uh, we'll also do, let me see if I get my mouse over here. We'll also do some swinging platforms so that they can get on something that's unsteady feeling. And whenever we, <laughs> whenever we cut down big trees out here, we'll save the, the large logs and we'll use those as part of their platforms or something for them to climb on. So each section of the enclosures have a guillotine door in the middle that we can use to uh, shift the cats. Because the cage wire is so small, we have to actually go in the enclosures to clean them. And uh, we use those guillotine doors to shut them away so that we can access the, the sides that we need for cleaning or maintenance. Every part of the enclosure has to be covered with a small wire because the live prey is really good at finding ways to try to get out. So even the water boxes on the enclosure have a smaller mesh wire on them. 
So this is uh, some of the slides here are going to show us uh, how we train them to hunt. They have a diet of whole and live prey during their time here. We don't actually give them full deer, but uh, they, their main diet consists of rats. They occasionally get rabbits. Um, this was just a really cool camera trap uh, photo I found online of a bobcat taking down a full-sized deer, which is pretty incredible, but not surprising considering their temperament. <laughs> uh, in the wild, they'll also eat birds, snakes, they'll bugs, lizards, um, all different kinds of things, quail and turkey. Um, but here, their main diet is rats. So when we got our first kitten that we needed to train to hunt, there wasn't a lot of information out there that you could get your hands on. Uh, so we had to kind of make up the program as we went. So this is a feeding station that we designed out of just a dog carrier, a really large one that we cut the top out of. Um, and then we put a chute in it that we could put food in from outside and we covered it with brush on the inside. So this was, um, the intent of this is to minimize our interaction with the cat when it's getting its uh, live prey. So, but it also provides a controlled environment so that the prey can't immediately escape the cat. We're not trying to teach adult cats how to hunt. They already know how to hunt. This is only for kittens. So what we do in this situation to train them to use this box is once they go outside, they'll already be eating whole prey, so chicks and rats, and we will take their food out to them and put it on the ground next to this feeding station for three or four days. And we'll, so we're training them to come that one spot over and over and over again. So once they learn that spot, we'll put the prey on top of the box and we'll do that again for three or four days. So the first day that they come and they don't see the food where they're used to seeing it, they use their uh, sense of smell and they find it on top of the box. And then we do it again, putting the prey inside the box. So it takes three steps to get them to use the box. Once they're going into the box for the prey, we'll put the live prey in there. And that's all that we have to do. We don't have to teach them how to hunt live prey. They have natural instincts that immediately kick in. The first time they jump in there and their prey is moving, it, it just fires in their brain and they know exactly what to do. It's, pre it's pretty amazing. Um, so this is the, the feeding station that we've been using. Um, so when we first started using it, We got most of the results we wanted, but you'll see here that as soon as we put the prey in and walk away, then here comes the bobcat. So we wanted to have more time between us putting the food in and the bobcat coming over. So that's when we designed Feeding Station 2.0. <laughs> and it's a, it was actually a Rube Goldberg machine. So does anybody know what that is? Yes. Okay. So it's a complex contraption of simple tasks dominoed to accomplish a greater task. So what we did here is the feeding station is on the other side of that little bamboo wall. Um, above it is a little chute that we would put the prey in, but there was a door keeping it from falling into the feeding station. So we'd load up that chute with the rat, and then we'd come back here and set this timer on a hose. So after 30 minutes or so, it would fill up the bucket with water, and the bucket would get heavy and drop to the ground, pulling the rope, opening the chute, and putting the prey into the feeding station. Mm -hmm. So we put the food in, and then a half an hour, up to an hour, whatever we wanted to put the timer on, that's how long it would be till the food got in there. So hopefully it was making some kind of disconnect between us arriving and food being there. <coughs> Once they uh, learn to use the feeding station and they're hunting prey successfully, uh, we'll start to use the rat tunnels. And this is, an, again, another older picture of our, our past rehab enclosures. So what we did here is we took big PVC pipes and we created a maze with them. And at, at the end of each PVC pipe was a drop station that has a screw lid where we can unscrew the lid, put the rat in, leave, and then the rat has all these options to take to go into the rehab enclosure. They all go into the rehab enclosure, so the 
outcome for the rat is always the same. But for the bobcat, it doesn't know which side of the enclosure that the rat was going to come out of. So that way we were varying the timing and the location that the prey was going into the rehab enclosures. This is the design of what we have now. So it's just one straight tube that goes through the whole enclosure, but we have little guillotine doors on the pipes as it goes through so we can shut those doors and manually pick where the rat's going to be going. So we can get the, we are varying which in, a part of the enclosure that the rat's going to and also getting the bobcat to utilize other parts of the enclosure if we want them to. I should turn that feature off for the presentation. All right, so here's a little uh, video. So the rats come out into the enclosure and they can't get through the larger wire. So by trying to vary where the rats come out and the timing that they come out, we're encouraging the bobcats to be in hunt mode pretty much all the time. We change the times of day that we'll go out and feed them and vary it as much as possible, which mimics what they will do in the wild. They're always looking for food in the wild. Um, so one thing that happened, yep. So do you guys, you said you vary like based on the rehabber, who, what time you guys go out? Mm -hmm. Oh, and it's not just the rehabber, like, it also revolves around what's happening day to day out here. So sometimes if we're super busy in the morning, we might go out in the afternoon or the other way around. But yeah, it very, each person has their own schedule that they go out. One thing that we do is uh, make sure of is every morning we check the water dishes to make sure that they have water. And then if we want to, we can come back and feed them or clean them later in the day. Uh, one of the things that I found with the rat tunnels is when we first put it together, we put um, a or we put it all together, and the rats were never moving out of that little drop station. And so, through trial and error, trying a bunch of different things, we learned that uh, drilling holes in the pipe along the way makes little bits of light that the rats will follow to go out. We have, and it's important to put those holes on the underside of the pipe so that you don't have rainwater collecting in there. This is something else we tried out in the old cages. Um, the pipes, the, the original pipes we had with just a few light holes were getting kind of dirty, so we wanted to try a cleaner pipe, uh, which was this mesh pipe um, that we put together with couplings. This didn't work out at all because the rats would just stay out there because it was nice. It was breezy and like grass would grow up <laughs> through the bottom and they would eat the grass and then the bobcats could see the rats coming from a mile away. So we got rid of those pretty quick. And we made Rat Tunnels 3.0. And these have <laughs> a ton of holes along the bottom. So it's lots and lots of drainage. And then we put um, uh, more space apart on the top holes so that the rainwater actually goes in through the top and cleans out the tunnels. Are these patented drainage? <laughs> I should, I'm I'm serious. Serious. <laughs> Get rehab in a kit. <laughs> we use a lot oh, I am of, so gonna do that. <laughs> we use a lot of uh, camera traps and remote wireless webcams to monitor the progress of the bobcats. The webcams are good because um, some of the cameras we have explore cameras out there, so they're twenty four seven, and people are always watching the cats, and they can update us if they see an issue with a cat earlier on. Um, other times it's good to use the camera traps because if we're looking for something specific we can set up the camera trap uh, where we want that so if we wanted to see if a cat could jump onto a platform well we could put the camera right next to the platform and then we'll put like spices or enrichment or food on the platform so we can get them to do what we want right in front of the camera uh, and this is great for monitoring uh, not only injured bobcats if they're healing well, but also the hunting skills of the kittens. <laughs> so this is just a little explore shout out. They, they are great. They watch the cats all the time and 
keep us up to date on everything that's in and outside of the rehab enclosures. <laughs> <laughs> we get a lot of wildlife visitors out to the rehab area. So this is a little video compilation of some of the images we've captured with the camera traps. an 18 pound turkey and a, a eight pound bobcat <laughs> <laughs> and she had no problem did we introduce that in there or did i get in my no we introduced we used to do turkeys in the past because that's a really good food source for them but they're hard to get a hold of <laughs> and some of the bobcats are so wild that the only time we can see them is with the camera traps or the, the webcams because when you go out there to check on them, it's not like the, the permanent residence here. We, we go out and we'll look forever for a cat and we'll have to come find help to help us find a cat because they can hide so well in the brush. So release sites. The thing with releasing the bobcats, like I said before, we have to release them in the same county that uh, they were found in, which we seem to have been just getting bobcats from every single county and so we have sites lined up in a lot of counties but not all of them <laughs> so each time we get one we have to try to make a new contact to find a site the site has to be a minimum of 40 acres of privately owned land so you can't just take the bobcats to the state park and put them back it doesn't make sense to us because that's what the state park is for wildlife but they don't want the liability of released rehabilitated animals being in the park and maybe somebody didn't do a good job rehabbing and the animal is imprinted so they don't want the public to be in danger for that which is really unfortunate because they own most of the land that's not developed um, so what we try to do is find ranchers or property owners near those parks <laughs> so um, that's a that's a challenge in itself um, most of the time uh, we go we will try for months to to secure a release site for a bobcat um we also will put out uh pleads on facebook sometimes or in the big cat times if we're looking for a specific county and uh if we get really desperate we start searching county records and we'll go through the county records online to find pieces of property that are large enough and then we'll just cold call the people and ask them if we can release on their property Uh, whenever possible, we also deploy camera traps where we release the bobcats to monitor uh, how they're doing. We have probably about between six and eight cameras out there right now. Um, sometimes the cameras are active for a few months. A lot of the, some of these places are three or four hours away, so we don't really keep traps going that long, great distances. But we have uh, camera traps that are really close by, just a few miles here from the sanctuary that we've been monitoring uh, for a couple years. During every initial exam of the bobcats, we'll take pictures of the spot patterns um, for identification purposes later in the, on the camera traps. The spot patterns are really distinct on the front and back legs as well as around the face. They don't really have that much spotting as you've seen on like Moses and Bailey on the sides and back. It's kind of uh, just blurry. So we'll take pictures of both sides of their legs and both sides of their face while they're sedated. Here are some camera trap pictures at some of our sites. And we'll get 10,000 pictures on a single camera that we have to go through one at a time. And the top left there, uh, below that is a blown up portion of the image. So there's actually a bobcat in that top left picture. Very, very hard to find, but it's there. So here's some of the bobcats. Um, this one, bottom right, is Thor, which we released uh, at the site just a few miles from here. 
some, we get a bunch of other animals in the camera traps too. We got otters and pigs and turkeys and deer. <laughs> <laughs> All kinds of stuff. So doing the, when we first started, the, or when I first took over the rehab program, like I said, there wasn't a lot of information out there to learn how to do, to rehab bobcats for release. So I documented everything along the way. All the things that did work, didn't work. I wrote an entire class on rehabbing uh, bobcats. And we get a lot of calls and people reaching out to us asking for any kind of protocols that they could use in their own situations. So we share all that information and this is just a list of some of the cats uh, around the country and around the world that we've been able to help with our uh, program that we utilize here. And that was actually one of the, one of the kittens that benefited from our rehab program, a little jungle cat kitten. Jamie, have you kind of set the standard Absolutely. as far as bobcat <laughs> rehabs now? I mean, I, th I think we have really, really good enclosures. Big, thanks to Big Cat Rescue and being what it is, we can, pro we can afford the enclosures and the care that we provide. It's really hard for just an a average rehabber to come up with funding to do something like that. Um, but I, yeah, I definitely think that we're up there in the top as far as bobcats for sure. Um, okay, so this is just a couple of the cats that we currently have in rehab. Uh, this is Aphrodite. She's an adult female bobcat. Um, she came here really out of it, really stunned. We weren't, she had no injuries, no uh, scratches or cuts or broken limbs. She just was really spacey. And we've seen that before with a head impact um, being hit by a car. And sometimes it's permanent and sometimes it fades. And in this case, it's faded. She has completely wild instincts, hunts very well on her own. She avoids us. Um, so we're actually looking for to release her uh, really soon. <laughs> Here's our Irish kittens. So um, with actually Noel, we just we went on this tangent of naming the kittens after the holidays that they were rescued near. So. We have Noel for Christmas, Aphrodite for Valentine's Day, and then we got these three kittens around St. Patrick's. So we have Lucky, Clover, and Shamrock. Lucky and Clover came from another facility uh, that didn't have the resources to provide long-term care uh, till they were adult uh, cats to be released. So they came here together, and very um, close to that we got Shamrock, who was a little bit younger, a little smaller, and uh, she was a single cat that came here. We housed them in two neighboring enclosures and over time we were able to introduce all three together and our plan is to release all three of them together at the, at the same site. And that'll be good for Shamrock because it'll give her someone to kind of lean on when they're first released. It's always best if we can to try to pair up kittens um, because just naturally in the wild when they would leave their mother they'd kind of go off together and, and learn from each other and help each other out for a little bit after they're on their own. So being able to put Shamrock with these two has just made her uh, success rate explode. I don't know. Words. <laughs> Brain. Sleepy. <laughs> These two cuties, Bravo and Tango, were orphaned following a uh, large tract of land that was clear cut for development. So one of the guys on the bulldozer found these kittens and rescued them and took them to a nearby rehabber who mainly does small animals, not large carnivores. So we uh, went and took these kittens to rehab. And shortly after their arrival, we got Foxtrot. And we, just the other day, introduced all three of them together. And they'll be rehabbed and released together as well. You can see Foxtrot has uh, very unusual markings on his back feet. He's got white toes on both back feet. So you can see that there in the picture. I actually forgot to put a picture of Echo in here, but that's our fourth kitten. Echo is a a little bit bigger than Foxtrot, Bravo, and Tango uh, by about a pound and a half. And so we're waiting for those three to get a little bit bigger before we introduce and have all four together. Here's a picture of Noelle who was just released uh, last week on 1200 acres. 
she was hit by a car on Christmas Day. She suffered uh, two broken legs on the same side. One leg was broken in one place, the other in two places. She had surgery and permanent plates and screws and hardware installed uh, to stabilize those broken bones and those will stay in there forever. They won't impede her at all. She did great through rehab. Um, she, I, th I think she was the one that was didn't have any feeling in that back leg for a long time. She was dragging it, um, but it, we put her on a bunch of medications and just gave her time in the hospital to get better and she ran like she had never been mm -hmm. injured at all. And she can fly. Yeah, she's a flying <laughs> <bumper>. <laughs> Uh, so here's just a few of the cases that we've had out here. Uh, this is when I first took over the rehab program. It was my first cat and this uh, was an eight week old bobcat which we had never done a rehabilitation of a kitten to adulthood for release. So she was a total guinea pig. Actually, Bailey. to learn to never go near humans and always be on the lookout for danger. This was before we had any rehab enclosures. Don't mind the servo in the background. It's good. <laughs> this is the first use of the feeding station as well. Big Cat Rescue has to teach her all that she will ever need to know to survive without the bobcat seeing her keeper. If she were to ever associate man with food, it could be the death of her. It's a lot of hard work, and her live rats are expensive, but it's worth it to be able to give her back the freedom that she was born to inherit. Um, so kittens will remain with their mother for up to a year in the wild. We always try to try to schedule the release times uh, during spring when there's a lot of new baby animals on the ground that are a little easier to catch. Uh, but we have to also incorporate in there the regulations of the time frame which you're allowed to keep bobcats, which is no greater than six months unless you have an exemption. Um, so we try to do the make the release them at the oldest possible we can for the, the younger bobcats and also during a time when prey is easier to catch. Uh, Faith was released on 2,000 acres that bordered a, an 18,000 acre park. So we aimed her towards the park but she totally went like all the way behind us off into the ranch. <laughs> but it's okay, she eventually made yeah, it's it over. The ranchers going wide, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've captured her on a camera a year later. This is just a cute, extreme close up of her eyeball. But we set up cameras along that stretch where she was released and got uh, pictures of her throughout. This cat was a hot mess. 
<laughs> Thor was uh, hit by a car in Brandon, actually near the Brandon Mall, uh, where there really wasn't any forest for him to live in, but he was hit by a car in the parking lot in the middle of the night. Um, what was extremely rare about his situation was the uh, law enforcement that arrived there stayed on scene until we were able to get there. A lot, that's the hardest thing when we go to find a bobcat that's been hit by a car, somebody will call it in, we'll drive you know, hours to go find the cat, but nobody's there waiting for us, so we have to guess where it went. And that's what happened today. We had a call today. We drove about an hour and a half uh, to try to find this bobcat. And um, when we got there, there was just no sign of it at all. And so it was awesome to have them wait there with him. This is actually a picture of him in the middle of the intersection um, and to monitor him until we could arrive. He had a broken canine, a broken jaw, a broken eye socket, and a shattered shoulder blade. You can see this picture here on the right, his bottom teeth his bottom jaw wasn't even connected, so you could take his canines and move them independently. So it was fractured right in the middle there. So he had to have a, <clears throat> a root canal to fix that broken tooth. We didn't want to pull the tooth because we wanted to give him as much of his canines as possible for release later on. So they did a root canal and took out the root of the tooth so it shouldn't cause him any uh, pain or infection later on. And his jaw was wired uh, together in the, where it was broken. Did we, that part stay in there? The wire comes out. After a couple weeks of healing, the bones will fuse back together. So um, after that, we woke up a day later and his eye was doing that. It was really big and the pupil was really small. And uh, we didn't uh, initially know that uh, he had a fractured eye socket. So we consulted with a specialist there and because the eye was swelling so much, he wasn't able to blink and it was starting to get dry. So the eye specialist told us to give him eye drops and that's <laughs> not possible. We tried it though. We put some eye drops in a syringe. Um, some of you that know how we used to flea treat the cats, we'd take a syringe uh, with a needle on it and we'd break off the needle so it was like a high pressured uh, point of liquid that would come out of the syringe and we did that to his eye once and not again <laughs> he just kept he kept moving his head and just laughing at the cage so we didn't want to cause him trauma trying to keep his eye healthy so what she did is she took his third eyelid and she pulled it over and sutured it closed. So that's what you see there. His third eyelid's covering up his eyeball completely so that it keeps it nice and moist until the swelling would go down. Once the swelling went down um, and she examined his eye, it <clears throat> was determined that he was blind in that eye. Did he have a head injury from the hit or what was the, uh, why, why was the swelling? Was that intracranial pressure? He had a fractured eye socket. Oh, he had a fractured yeah. okay. Um, so on top of all that, he was refusing to eat, refusing to drink, he wouldn't take his meds, he wasn't getting any fluids. Um, so we had a little talk one night, late, late at night in the hospital, just the two of us. <laughs> and like I said, I don't normally talk to these cats but since it was such a stressful situation for both of us I just asked them please eat that's all I had to do and I would leave them alone most of the day <laughs> and so um, what we did is we I put a bunch of food in a blender actually my magic bullet from home gross <laughs> and I made them a meat smoothie and I had pulled it up in a syringe and we have basically an, it's a pull syringe so it's an extension to a syringe so you can put a regular syringe on the end but you have like three feet of piping so that you can syringe something from farther away. Once you can get one, like one or two syringe full of food into a cat's mouth that's not eating, sometimes that's all it takes to get them to turn around and start eating again. So that's what we did um, and we eventually transitioned from that sort of feeding to eating out of a bowl. Whoopsies. Here comes syringe, the hiss is at me, boom, you get your food. <laughs> <laughs> but he 
swallowed it, and so that's all that mattered. And then we worked to this. <laughs> he just refused to pick it up off the floor, probably because his mouth and his face hurt, and his shoulder was, you know, all broken. But we eventually got him to eat from a higher point, lower, lower, lower to the ground. And this was the magic day when he decided to eat on his own. It was over the course of like maybe a week total. So yeah, and we mixed water in with his food because he was not drinking at all. So we were trying to get fluids in him any way possible. We even bought him a water fountain, like a fancy cat. So he eventually started to love life in the hospital. He loved his little fleece beds, <laughs> loved his water fountain, hated us, hated us the whole time, which is good. So he had eight weeks of recovery inside the cat hospital and then another five weeks of recovery outside in the rehab enclosures. <laughs> this is just his typical attitude towards us. So he was release, released on 100 acres a few miles from here. The nice part about where he was Bonnie's face makes it. The, yeah, she's like, are you sure about this? <laughs> and then Carol's like, I don't know, I might use this stabilizer to beat that cat away. <laughs> I'm like, we had this talk, you go. <laughs> <laughs> so he was stubborn to the very last day, even the signs falling off of him. <laughs> he was a mess. But uh, the good thing about, he was released on a relatively small site as far as what we normally go for, 100 acres. But the nice place, thing about the place was that it was where power lines go through. So power lines are natural corridors for them to travel as far as they want to other areas of forest. So he actually sticks around there and we get pictures of him often on the cameras. But yeah, I think he's probably one of my favorites. <laughs> so here's a picture of him four months after release. This little guy was found on a tennis court just a couple miles from here. Uh, he was captured by a trapper, um, but, but later the trapper brought him to us so we could rehabilitate him. He, was, he suffered from birth defects. He had um, very little habitat where he came from. He had an orange-sized herniated area of organs in his abdomen, so it was just like a small hole in the abdominal wall that a bunch of organs had gone out of and they were just under the skin, most, like, most likely from being hit by a car. The hole though wasn't a cause of the accident. It looked more like a birth defect. It was very perfect and smooth and round. Normally in a trauma situation where they were hit by a car, it would be a tear in the muscle wall. He was also missing his right eye, which again wasn't from a injury. It, the structure and everything around there was very deformed and small, so he was born that way. He recovered from his surgery as well and was released eight months later at the same ranch as um, Faith. And here... So here he is going, and lucky for us, we were on his blind side. Because he goes all the way around us, and then I looked over, us. So I looked over my shoulder, and I'm like, oh! <laughs> but we were on the side, but he didn't have an eye, so well, it was okay. Now. <laughs> yeah. Here he is looking at a camera a couple weeks after his release. This was a sad one. Uh, Poseidon, he had a severe parasite infestation. He had mange. Uh, he was found just laying in the front yard of somebody's, or actually on an empty lot next to somebody's house. And he'd been laying there all afternoon. And it took us hours to drive out there and get him. Um, even though he looks really gross and he's got so many parasites, it's actually really, really treatable. 
all you have to do is give them some flea treatment and some fluid therapy and they can completely recover from something like this. But the problem was uh, he had been like this for so long that his immune system had weakened. He had um, a bunch of rashes where the mites had burrowed in and had given him skin infections. And on top of that, he was shot in the shoulder. There's some, you can see the little perfect circle next to his shoulder in the x-ray there. There was some bullet in there. And he had bite wounds all over his arms and his back, probably from coyotes. Uh, we don't know which injury came first. Any of them could have been the one that led to the other that led to the other. But he just had so many things going against them uh, that unfortunately we weren't able to save him. But we tried our best. And at least he was comfortable when he went. This is Skip. <laughs> he was hit by a car and rescued by individuals. They picked him up and put him in the back of their car with a blanket. Um, they luckily survived. <laughs> he came to life in the SUV. He was stunned at the side of the road, but he started to come to his senses. And sometime between when they rescued him, we got there, they were able to get him into a carrier, and we took over. His pelvis was shattered on one side. Uh, you can see it's much shorter on the top view. That was all shattered and crumpled in, and on the other side, it was completely disconnected from the spine. So we installed uh, screws and plates to kind of hold the one part that was disconnected back to the spine. And then the doctor rebuilt the pelvis. And, but you can see it's still much shorter at the top than it is at the bottom. So um, we just did the best we could with what was left in there. He had eight weeks of recovery in a small cage. And he was so angry about being in the hospital and was constantly digging at the cage and pulling at the wire that we had to treat him with medications to alleviate his stress. And every time we went in, this is all we saw. He would just hunker down and hiss at us and we could never see if he was getting up and using his back legs. And so this is when we first used the webcams uh, and made him live and invited the public to help us monitor him because he was so difficult for us to get any kind of look at him. He was also the first uh, cat with his own fan club on Facebook. And they're watching your um, live right now. They're like, where are the Skippies? So we have the Skippaholics or Skippies. Uh, he had 248 Facebook fans and 77,000 viewers on Ustream where his camera was. Um, and they were the first to catch problems with him. He was uh, constipated and vomiting, which are signs to us that he's got some sort of blockage. So uh, in the end, he regained the ability to walk, run, jump, um, but because of his antics in the cat hospital during his recovery and not taking it easy and resting, he uh, shifted the pelvis bones so that they actually healed too narrow. The pelvic canal was too narrow for him to eat bones and fur uh, and pass it. So he was eating that stuff and then it was getting stuck and he was vomiting um, and then we'd have to manually get that out. Uh, so he was going to have to be on a soft food diet for the rest of his life, for, like mush, um, which made him not a candidate for release. This is a little um, video of him in his in a permanent enclosure here. He became a permanent resident. He only really came out at night. He hit a lot during the day. He was very wild still. <laughs> so he was a permanent resident here for quite a while. Um, but then one morning during feeding time, he had a fit where he was running around the enclosure. He was foaming at the mouth. He had a seizure and then he just died. We tried to uh, administer rescue drugs to bring him back, um, but it didn't work. I tried to give him CPR, 
which at the time seemed like a good idea, but it wasn't. Um, <laughs> one, if he was to wake up, then I'd be kissing on a wake bobcat. <laughs> Two, he was running around, foaming in the mouth, and had a seizure and died. So those all say maybe rabies, and there's rabid animals that are out here in the wild that could come in contact with some of the permanent residents. So then I ran and got the first thing I could find, which was a Gatorade, and I washed out my mouth with Gatorade, <laughs> and <laughs> hope for the best. So this is why it's very, very important to have proactive uh, rabies vaccinations, which I didn't have at the time, and they cost about $900, but it's a lot cheaper than what you have to pay if you're exposed to rabies and you're not pre-vaccinated, and it's a lot better than dying of rabies. So I highly recommend them. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that really stunk about the whole thing was we sent him to the University of Florida to get tested um, for to try to find out what why he passed away. He was also tested for rabies, um, and there was a time period when you're exposed to rabies and when you have to get the vaccines, which I think is like ten days, but it took him like a week to get the results for his rabies test. So I had seven days of wondering whether or not I had rabies and trying to remember not to share my drinks with anybody. Um, so, um, so he, they couldn't find anything at the University of Florida that would really explain what happened to him. They sent him to California that was doing another university that was doing a study on uh, bobcat diseases. And unfortunately, between Florida and California, he was lost in the mail. Wow. So we have no definitive wow. answers. Where's <laughs> yeah, my package? All right, so this is Ace. She was found a few miles from here as well. She, there was a big office complex, a big building with all kinds of different offices in it, and she was just laying on the front steps of the building when people got there for work one morning. She had been seen eating out of dumpsters frequently around the office building. Uh, There's no nearby habitat that um, she could have hunted in, so she was eating all just garbage and scraps. Um, when she came in, she only weighed 11 pounds, and normally that initial exam that we do on the cats where we sedate them, um, she wasn't healthy enough to do that right away. So we put her out in the rehab enclosures and we fed her every day and we fattened her up a little bit. And this is what she looked like after she was fattened up. How old was she? Uh, we estimated her over 15 years old. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because you can see that her teeth are very worn down, they're really yellow. She had a very dull coat, she had cataracts and uh, just depleted muscle tone all over her body. So she was an old girl. It was, it was amazing that she had been surviving as long as she did on what she was eating. What if the people at the office thought, you know, they had they always give them kibbles and bits and different stuff? <laughs> it's <parts>. possible. Yeah. <coughs> so during her rehabilitation here, she tested positive for FIV, which is the, the equivalent of AIDS in people. So that's a highly contagious uh, disease that attacks the immune system in uh, cats and so it's spread through blood and saliva and because of the potential for her to infect the Florida panther population she was denied a uh, release so she became a permanent resident here she lived here for four years and she loved it she was waiting in her lockout every day for food because she had been living next to that office park and seeing people every single day she was very habituated to people so she had no problem at all living in captivity she even had a skippy bed in her den outside <laughs> so this is hope uh, my first kitten was eight weeks old that we rehabilitated. She was already eating uh, whole prey and foods like that. Uh, we never had attempted to take a bottle baby and raise it for release. So normally they would wean around eight weeks or so in the wild. I mean, they would continue to nurse the mother, but about eight weeks they'll start eating solid foods. So she came here at four weeks old and she was totally dependent on a bottle. She was found on the side of the road 
And we went back out to the site to see if we could hear the mother calling because we thought maybe the mother was relocating her den site and uh, got separated from the kitten. So we do try to go out and see if we can hear calls and reunite the kittens if possible. So this was the first uh, time we used a surrogate domestic cat mother that was already nursing two orphans that weren't her own. It's been a long journey for Hope and an amazing experience to watch her grow up. <laughs> so having those domestic siblings is great. She has somebody to play with, somebody to teach her hunting skills. adopted by a domestic cat family gave Hope the perfect opportunity to learn skills that she would need to survive in the wild. <laughs> <laughs> like climbing trees face first. Yeah. <laughs> At just a few months old, oh Hope moved into an enclosure designed specifically for rehabilitating her pets. It is in here that she would learn how to climb trees, conceal herself in the brush, and hunt. This experience would give her first-hand knowledge of what it's like to live in the wild. finally ready to be released back into the wild. She has learned how to hunt her own food and take care of herself. release day was a day that big cat rescuers dream of to be able to watch as one of these beautiful cats is returned back into the wild where it rightfully belongs it's definitely been a long journey hope and we wish you all the best <laughs> so there's actually um i think like 12 or 13 episodes that documents her whole progress through rehab. It's on our Big Cat TV channel and you can just search the word Hope the Bobcat or something and it'll come up. Um, so she was with her domestic family until she was about three months old and then she stopped hanging out with them. She started sleeping in different areas of the enclosure and that's when we pulled the mom and the two cats out and then tried to find people that wanted to adopt feral kittens. <laughs> <laughs> but they had a cool story, so it actually was pretty easy. Uh, she was released when she was 11 months old in the springtime and at the same ranch as Faith and Chance. Her story was also so unique that it was featured in an issue of National Geographic Kids magazine. And if you look for that magazine on Amazon, it's that issue that pops up. <laughs> uh, so here we have Ivan. He was seen in a neighborhood that was pretty forested along a creek. Um, the, we were told that he had in, an injury to his leg. It looked like a cut. Um, and it was 
hours away. So we loaded up in the car and fully expecting that by the time we got there, the cat would probably be gone because it was walking around. It just looked like it had an injury. We nearly gave up on the search. There was a big uh, swath of land along the creek that was totally forested, <laughs> very overgrown. We just lined up and walked the whole thing uh, for hours looking for this cat. And just as we were um, about to get into the van to come back, we heard some dogs barking down the street. So we just decided to go ahead and follow that and the dogs led us to the cat in the back of somebody's house. We caught the cat. Once we got it into the crate, we saw that it was actually missing its arm. You can see just a little bone there uh, through the wire. And that was most likely uh, caused by trapping. Uh, the animal will chew its leg free. Um, or if the limb was broken in a trap, sometimes they'll chew away an injured part of themselves. So that's probably what happened there. <clears throat> the whole ride back to the sanctuary, we contemplated, you know, we've done all these other amazing rehab and releases would it be possible to rehab and release a three-legged bobcat? So we really thought about it the whole ride home. We decided we would give it a shot. You but that want to warn people before you go to the Yeah, the next picture is not so fun to look at, so be aware. So when we got there and we sedated the cat and pulled him out of the blankets, he's actually missing both front legs. And he had been walking around like that for weeks. Um, the bones were very dried and rounded. And it's amazing that he was even evading us. And it got away from you. So yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, they're tough. They're very tough. Uh, it was, I've never seen anything like that ever in my life, but it's very sad. And we decided obviously just to humanely euthanize him. This is Fencer. He was literally caught by a single toe in a fence. The knee, a person had gone into their backyard to drink their morning cup of coffee. You could see a little kid's playhouse over there. And there was a bobcat hanging from the fence in the background. <laughs> And so um, this is uh, a case where it's really important to have good relationships and with your veterinarians if you're going to do rehab work because you can't carry around sedation drugs for these animals. So you have to have a vet that's willing to come out with you and dart the animal. In this situation, uh, Fencer was, had his adrenaline going really high and he had to be darted multiple times. So you can see multiple darts sticking in him there. But in this bottom right picture, you can see he's still fully awake and looking at us. So we just, we couldn't dart him anymore. Couldn't give him any more medication. So we had to just go in there and get him. So we, we had actually an animal control officer on the scene with us. And he had a catch pole. So he used that to hold the cat down. And he was, you could see his toe up there on the top right. It's just caught right in the little corner of the wire. So we asked permission and we just cut that fence right out and took it with him. Um, so he's got the fence there on his toe, we got him netted, we got him into the transport crate and we took him right uh, to the clinic to have x-rays. So there's a little piece of wire that we removed. It had just had that little bend in it that his toe got stuck in. Um, other than that, he had a little cut on his toe, um, but he had actually broken his toe. So you can kind of see right here two little breaks in that mm -hmm. toe and what you would normally do um, is put a splint on it but a bobcat's not going to tolerate a splint mm -hmm. so because he has the other toe bones on either side of that it's kind of a natural splint so we just kept him in a smaller enclo enclosure in the hospital and gave him some time to recover on the right there is the fused bone after it had some time to heal so he had um, four weeks of recovery in the hospital and we wanted another four weeks outside but he was so adamant about going. He, we had one week of recovery outside. So after a week, we took him to his release site, um, six weeks after his rescue, on 7,400 acres of land. And he ran away like there was no tomorrow. <laughs> Bellin is a really good example of how expensive rehab can be and uh, why it's so important to have good fundraising program to support your uh, rehabbing. She was hit by a car and lying on the side of the road. That's just literally the curb right on the side of the highway. She had a severely broken leg and her tail had been degloved, so they had to partially amputate the tail. And because they won't tolerate a cast or anything external, you have to use all internal things like screws and plates and pins to put the legs back together. 
so she had a surgery to repair the broken leg that was $3,800. And then she had to recover inside in the hospital in a small enclosure for four months. When we moved her out, so on the right here is what her leg looked like after surgery, it's nice and straight. When we moved her out to the rehab enclosure, she bolted from the transport, ran straight into the first wall she came to, and she bent the plate on her leg. By doing so, she displaced her kneecap and um, she had to go back for a second surgery to fix her kneecap, which is $1,400, and then another four months in the cat hospital. So then she had eight months of recovery outdoors and $1,200 worth of food during that time. So she was getting to be a really, really expensive bobcat. But she recovered fully at a total time of 16 months and a cost of about $6,400 and she was released onto a 500 acre uh, piece of property. Do we do our own vets do the surgery here, uh, Jamie, or do or, we have to bring an orthopod in? Early on, we, Bellina's case, uh, we took to a specialty clinic, um, which is why it's, it's why very it expensive. So yeah. Um, in some cases, like we'll have to call in specialists, like the Thor's root canal, we had to have a dental specialist come in. All the bone surgeries that uh, Dr. Justin does now. But we don't have the plates or anything, so we have to take them. Yeah, we don't have the, the have any of the stuff. stuff. So yeah. we take them to the Humane Society where they do the surgery. Okay. <clears throat> so they have the plates here as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mrs. Claus! <laughs> so she was found orphaned with bites to her head. Um, the first rehabber she went to didn't have facilities for long-term care. She was also rescued with another cat named Mr. Claus, and we attempted to raise them together so that um, we could release them together. But Mrs. Claus was a little special, most likely because of the damage to her brain um, from the bite wounds. And she was attacked by Mr. Claus and had to come in for some, some wound repair in the hospital, and that's why she's wearing an e-collar there. She, throughout her rehab, we really had a hard time with her. We couldn't tell if she had vision damage or brain damage. She was just overall slow. We'd give her a rat, a white rat sitting on the ground and she'd come over and bite the ground like within a few inches of it, like she couldn't find it. Um, she also wasn't, she, she couldn't learn the steps of how to do the hunting. She had just a really hard time throughout her whole rehab and we just decided that she wasn't gonna be a good candidate for release. So she became a permanent resident here and now lives with Nabisco. Mm -hmm. and here we have uh, two more kittens that we raised together. This is our, I think our first, one of our first where we took the kittens and put them together and released them together. So we had an orphaned male separated in a fire and he was found during uh, the news coverage of the story and he was left there in hopes his mother would return but she never did. We also had another bobcat about the same age um, that was caught by a trapper. Alright, here's a little video of them playing in the rehab cage together. <laughs> so they were perfectly the same size, they were a perfect match. So here's a little side by side of Phoenix uh, when he got here at 10 weeks old and then again at nine months old. And kept Tiva. And they were released together on 14,000 acres down in Panther Country. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <Not that. laughs>
So they're kind of looking at each other like, what do you think? <laughs> Should we do it? Captiva was a little more reluctant. <laughs> Bobcats are wild animals and they deserve a life of freedom. <laughs> so is this down by uh, Captiva Island in that area or where are you? Down where you are? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 so this was the group of people that went on that release. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's a little north of uh, Everglades so, oh, okay. Park. That's why you said there's country. Yeah. And I actually, I have a camera, or I had a camera there that I got Florida Panthers on when it was in the location. Okay. So here was Mr. Claus, the one that came with Mrs. Uh, he was hit by a car and he was hiding under a parked car at the YMCA and rescued by a sheriff. He was taken to a rehabber who didn't have the means to provide the surgery and stuff that he required. So we took him to the Humane Society where Dr. Justin performed his surgery. So this is how to fix a broken leg in under a minute. <laughs> That's the bone. So he has to cut the plates and bend them to contour to the leg bone as he's going. Do you remember how long that was? How long? How long it really took? Probably about two, two and a half hours for sedation to finish. So after time recovering, he was released on 12,000 acres, uh, the same site we just took Noel to. And we let Dr. Justin do the honors on that one. And you'll see it's like he never had an injury at all. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Uh, so, in conclusion, the goal of rehab is to care for the injured or, in, or orphaned wildlife until they can take care of themselves, um, all the while making sure that we don't make them dependent on us and keeping them as wild as possible. Every case is so different and exciting that we always see stuff that's new and uh, that we would never expect. And we also get to test our creativity constantly. We're always evolving the cages, evolving the furnitures that we put in there to get different behaviors out of them, uh, figuring out different ways to feed them, just keeping it fresh all the time, which is really, it makes it really fun. Uh, but along with being fun, it's also very hard work. There's the landscaping, there's the fundraising and the vet care and the enclosure maintenance, all that goes into it too. Uh, but being able to release them back in the wild where they go is so completely rewarding that it makes it all worthwhile. And that is it. Any so, questions? Yeah, anybody have a question? Do you ever tag or chip any of these animals? 
We haven't tagged or chipped any of them. We've talked about maybe doing a radio collar. Um, it's just, there's good and bad, you know, it could impede them because they, you know, have this thing around their neck, but it would be interesting for sure to see like their movements and where they're going. And Just to see what their long-term survival situation mm -hmm. is considering they go through so much of abnormal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Things. So, I mean, the best we've done so far is just the camera trapping. And we've gotten images of cats years after. That's so. what I was going to ask. How yeah. many years have we been able to track them, like from the first? I set cameras up where Faith was for, I think, three years. Wow. Yeah. And that that was really our first kind of test case with the kitten being raised to adulthood. So. I know one of the questions people always ask online is why we don't microchip them because I think they think that you can scan from the air a microchip. Yeah. They don't realize you have yeah. to be like a yeah. foot away. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be useful to microchip them. But. Yep. Is there like a limit to um, how many bobcats you can release on the same like property? Like say from there's no regulations, but we try not to uh, over release on sites. So depend like that hundred acre site that we have nearby, we would probably only use, you know, a couple times mm -hmm. or we'd space it out years. Like, you know, they only have a certain lifespan in the wild. So, um, but some of the places we're going are thousands of acres and bobcats are really, um, tolerant of transient bobcats going through territories so they'll allow another bobcat to kind of pass through and to try to find their own space speaking of those territories how big is a bobcat's normal territory um it can be anywhere from one to six square miles it just all depends on how dense the the forest is and how much prey is available they can also live in very close proximity to neighborhoods and survive in a very small forest get calls all the time when I first built Tampa Calm, we get them in a gift shop and uh, all over by um, Hunter's Green. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a bobcat, come get it. <laughs> well, no you don't, mm -hmm. you have a new neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> so. you, pay for, you pay for that conservation easement exactly. behind your house. <laughs> So yep. if you release them on private on pri on those private lands near the parks and the bobcats end up going into the parks, are you still liable, or is it just like from there you're just yeah. Well, if you them? have a uh, you have to have written permission from the landowner where you release, and as long as it meets that and the forty acre requirement, that's all that we have to be involved with. Where the bobcats go from there is it's their choice. Okay. Yep. So I heard um, Carol talking about this on one of your videos yesterday or the day before. But what happens, like with the three, like lo or fluffy and clover, and for that, yeah. So what happens with those three um, when you release them? Were they all found in the same county? Or they not? were found in different counties, and in that situation, we would ask for an exemption. And most cases, the Fish and Wildlife Department will grant it because it just makes sense for the cats to to go together. Um, so that's what we're hoping will happen in this situation. We have a question here about whether or not you've ever rehabbed Florida panthers. We have not rehabbed Florida Panthers, but uh, we'll try it if somebody wants to bring me one. <laughs> yeah. uh, so in the case of like the release of multiple bobcats, it would be completely up to them whether they stay together or if they would just disperse? Mm -hmm, yeah, and but really it's most likely for them to stay together at least for a couple weeks. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if they stayed together for several months after release. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're gonna have a little bit of a challenge I haven't quite figured out what I want to do with it um, to kind of go off of what you asked about releasing too many bobcats in one area if we introduce echo to the Fox Trot Bravo Tango group then that's four and so I'm not really sure what size land I would think would be appropriate to send four carnivores into at the same time <laughs> but we'll, we'll come to that hurdle when it gets here <laughs> yeah so you take each like rehab case on a case-by-case -case basis or do you take like do you have a protocol that needs to be in place for them to be released uh hmm? <laughs> <laughs> like each bot will take any bobcat if we don't no, have like space we'll build a cage be like do they have to meet certain protocols oh. do you have a certain protocol in place or is it like a case-by-case -case basis it, and it actually it, does have to be a florida bobcat What's that? Mm, it has to be a Florida bobcat. I can't take I'm that. I'm not answering yeah. this question. <laughs> so, well, no, I get what you're saying. Okay. Um, we have protocols that we, like, we, we want them to score well on our test before they're released. So we don't want them 
to approach us for food. Um, we want to be able to see through monitoring them that they're able to hunt efficiently, that they're not taking a long time to dispatch their prey. Um, and that they're healthy enough to walk around, you know, if they had an injury, that nothing is impeding them from doing any kind of activity that they should be able to do. So if, they're, if all those things are happening, then they're a candidate for release. If they're coming straight up to us for food, that's not good. We don't want to send them out where they're gonna get shot by a hunter or approach somebody and hurt them. We don't want that to happen. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah. How many bobcats have we successfully rehabbed and released? Oh, big bunches. <laughs> um, do you remember how, how big that list is? Susan said like 32 or 39 successes, I think. Wow. Does that count the, pa the ones that pass away? or? No, we've had a total of like 79 calls. So some of them we didn't find yet, them. some were dead. So nearly 40, that's what I was going to guess, yeah. And that's and since 2003. Mm -hmm. If you've ever like had a bobcat that went through the rehab and then was released and then like was injured again like would you take it back in and then do the whole process over i think so yeah i'd be kind of <laughs> sad like what happened we talked about this <laughs> but it hasn't happened yet but yeah we would we would do it over again and then we just you know we'd we monitor them during the rehab to make sure that there wasn't a reason that they got injured again before we releasing them. Release yeah. Uh -huh. So you know, Jamie, how they, you know, the tall stories that have been floating around for years and years. At one point, I, was, I remember hearing that somebody had to check off the cat. Was it, and I didn't know whether it was a third party that had to come in. That's only if you, it's, we're saying it's not a candidate for release. So if in case of like Mrs. Claus where she was just not, um, mentally sound enough to survive on her own that's my judgment call but then i have to get a veterinarian and our fwc inspector to also look at her and, and agree can we put that somewhere because you know a lot of people are very curious about our rehab program mm -hmm. and i have heard multiple variations of that story and those questions don't you know, usually come up after the tour mm -hmm. so it's not doesn't fall into the you know Vox yeah system we could add that it would to be our something rehab page. that would be nice to have as so that everybody's giving the same information yeah for sure we could add it to there that would be the best place to put it yeah or even at the end of the yeah, at the end of the box mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. okay anybody else all right thank you guys mm -hmm.